I think we're live. Here we go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess we're just waiting for people to hop in and stuff. Um, yeah. Did you have a lot of dogs today? Today during the day, yes. Oh my gosh. Cool. So I, this is one of the weeks that I go to Alabama over the weekend. So my training mentor lives in Alabama for bird dog training. Mm -hmm. so like once a month, I go down to meet with him, do some work with Shug, and this is one of those weekends, so it means a lot of work Monday through Wednesday before I take off, but gotcha. it's so much fun getting down there. I bet. Oh. So you fish, but do you do you do any hunting? A little bit, yep. A little bit? Okay, yep. awesome. We're going to have to do yep. something. Yeah, we do that there. Are you ready to get started? Let's go. Cool. All right. Well, welcome everybody to tonight's uh, Fall Orvis Days event. Um, ben Harris, uh, District Manager uh, for Orvis in the Midwest region. And tonight I have Melinda Benbow from uh, Urban Uplander Pet Care. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Been with Orvis for about 13 years. Uh, I've always had dogs in my life. Um, and I'm excited to be here tonight and with Melinda to, to cover some topics around dog care and dog training. Um, we look forward to sharing some tips and best practices. And uh, Melinda, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Melinda. Uh, I'm the owner and operator and head trainer of Urban Uplander Pet Care in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, our business is primarily an in-home pet care service where we go home to home caring for pets within their home. Um, that means daytime walks for people that work long hours or vacation care for people who have dogs that prefer to stay at home, elderly dogs, um, other dogs that maybe have medical restrictions. Um, and then we also offer boarding from our home. So we offer boarding to anyone, but we do provide our training, which allows the dogs that come for training to stay for daycare, do some socialization days, keep up with their training all that good stuff. And we also provide different types of resources for positive reinforcement uh, upland training. Cool. Uh, all right, so let's jump on in. We want this to be interactive, fun. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them over. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, with that, uh, Melinda, do you wanna kick us off? I guess, first question, What is what is dog training and why is it important? Yeah, uh, so number one, I mean, if you're on Facebook, I just want to point out real quick that my bird dog training mentor, Dr. Dale Hubbard, is going to be in that comment area. Um, so if you do have questions, he may pop in and field them. His name's Wayman Hubbard, so he's supposed to be there helping you. Um, I see him on also, there. <laughs> right? Um, and I think these tips are going to be best for the proactive dog owner, you know, someone who's just now bringing in a dog to their family, whether it's a rescue or you're purchasing a puppy. Um, if you are dealing with specific training issues already, um, I would definitely recommend reaching out to a professional in your area. These are going to be great tips, but um, nothing beats contacting someone that can actually come out, assess your dog and give you a great plan of action moving forward. Um, but dog training is essentially a way of communication between humans and dogs, right? Um, I speak English, they speak dog. So we need to translate somewhere. Uh, and that's what dog training does for us. Um, it allows us to be able to speak to our dog uh, more efficiently than just waiting for situations to happen and then figure out, well, how do I correct them now that they're here? Um, so a great way to understand what training is, is through the idea of classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Um, classical conditioning being just basic associations to things like when I grab the treat bag, my dog comes running. So they associate that sound of the treat bag with I get a yummy reward or something like I'm about to go on a walk. So I lace up my shoes and all of a sudden my dog's right there. You know, that action of putting on my shoes equals dog knows we're going to go on a walk. Um, whereas operant conditioning is going to be understanding the four quadrants. Um, I know people hear these things a lot, but I don't think an explanation really comes about for what they are. So I'm super excited to talk about this today. Um, so positive reinforcement, I think is something that people hear a lot and it should be known that when we say positive, we really mean adding something, not necessarily like our outlook or our cheery, you know, positive personalities. It's positive as adding something. So when we say positive reinforcement, we mean adding something to make a behavior more likely to happen. Um, so if we say positive punishment, we're saying adding something to make a behavior less likely to happen. So reinforcement being 
seeing something occur over and over and um, punishment being the decease of something from happening. So then you have negative punishment, which is removing something to make me have negative um, re reward, reinforcement, which is going to be taking something away to make behavior more like to happen. So understanding those five things, classical conditioning and the four operant, uh, four quadrants of operant conditioning is going to help any pet owner be way better off with their dog training. You know, um, I talk to clients all the time. They tell me about all the things they're doing to stop their dog from doing things or, or correct a, a certain behavior. And it should be known that as much as we correct a dog, we have to tell them what they're doing right, you know. So that's where training right. kind of comes into play is not just correcting dogs when they're doing something wrong, but setting them up to understand when they're doing the correct thing as well. Yeah. All right. Um, so what should what should new dog? There's I guess let's start here. There's been a record number of adoptions over the past 12 to 18 months, right? With the yeah. current environment, um, a lot of people's co-workers, their dog these days. So what, what should dog owners prepare for when bringing a new dog or puppy home? Yeah, I mean, dogs are through the roof. I mean, pets are through the roof right now, right? Everyone's yeah. adopting, everyone's purchasing. And so I think that's a great place to start of adopting and purchasing. Um, we live in a world where um, there's a lot of talk about each. And I think it's very important to understand that both are highly rewarding um, and they go into training very much. Um, so the way I may work with a rescue dog may not be the same way I work with a puppy that comes from a breeder. Um, you know, genetics are as equally important as basic training when it comes to dogs. So they kind of work with each other or work against each other depending on the situation. So yeah, adopting through the roof right now, uh, I mean, it was through the roof. We're actually seeing a lot more dogs hop back into shelters. So. I do recommend if you are looking to get a dog, starting out understanding what adoption really is. You know, what you're signing on for when you bring home a dog that's kind of been through trauma in its life possibly, um, and just being as educated as possible. Same for puppy buyers. You have to be super educated when knowing to go, uh, who to go to for your dog. Um, not all breeders are created equally, so make sure that you're going to someone who health tests their dogs, does DNA tests, does chick testing, which is OFA. Um, just ensure that you're actually contributing to ethical breeders and not helping these dogs go into the shelters. Um, so I think that's a wonderful note to start on. Um, but I think, you know, it starts with preparing your home, right? You know. We bring dogs home, whether it's a dog or a puppy, it's new to our home, new to our environment, and dogs tend to use their noses and their mouths to explore the world around them. Uh, so the first thing you can do is prepare. Um, you know, in my living room, when we brought Suge home, first thing we did was reorganize everything. And I know a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I don't want to reorganize my life for a dog, <laughs> but essentially it's like a kid, you kind of have to, right? I have to. Puppy proofing, child proofing, it's the same thing. Yep. So, um, you know, Go through your house, see what's on low shelves, see what's on the ground, and think from a dog's perspective. Is this something that they could maybe utilize as a chew toy, something that could harm them? Um, so I would, you know, pick up any shoes, find new storage areas for those. Um, anything on low shelves that a dog could just snatch up and, and start using as a chew toy, move those to higher areas. Um, if you keep books around, magazines, paper, um, pens, stuff that they could easily grab off an end table or a coffee table, pick them up, put them away. Um, and at least for the time that you're instilling behaviors in your dog. I'm not saying that you can't ever keep your shoes out again, but if you know you're bringing home a new dog or a puppy, set them up for success by moving these things out of the way. Um, that also means deep cleaning. I know maybe just for me, since I live in literally a dog boarding facility, I did so much cleaning before she got home, every carpet, every little spot that I thought that a dog has even slightly marked, I sanitized. Um, number one, old stains around potty stains, poop, pee, what have you. Uh, those are an open invitation for new stains. You know, if yeah. it's very <clears throat> natural for dogs to sniff, smell pee, and decide to mark over that pee. So uh, especially if you're with a puppy and you want to try to facilitate that, get those old stains out of there. Because um, they're going to think it's it's very inviting to, to pee where the last dog is already peed. Right. Um, so with that, I mean, also, once again, speaking as someone who 
has a lot of dogs in their house. Um, the illnesses that puppies can pick up are, are pretty large um, and it's pretty easy, especially for young unvaccinated or not completely vaccinated dogs. Uh, so sanitizing your house and making sure that you have it as clean as possible is going to be beneficial. Um, on the topic of cleaning and reorganizing, if you keep detergent, bug spray, weed spray, anything that could be toxic to an animal, pick it up, store it away where they can't get to it. Um, and then with that, you're going to want to check your yard. You know, uh, you're going to want to make sure that you do a perimeter check. If you do have a fenced in yard, make sure that all parts of your fencing are still intact. There's no places that Fido can slip through. Um, making sure there's no dangerous debris out there, glass, you know, brick, you know, anything that they could cut themselves on or pick up and ingest, you're going to want to get out the yard. Um, and then once again, old potties, you know, I know for me, when we bring puppies into the house, we're always sanitizing the yard just based out of the nature of our job. But you really want to make sure that these puppies can't pick up things from other dogs, whether it's in, you know, internal parasites, kennel cough, parvo, anything like that. Um, cause they can be very hard to treat and sometimes the uh, chances that they actually recover can be pretty small. Um, so definitely clean the yard, reorganize your house, clean inside your house, and then purchase everything you need for your dog. Takes us to the next one, right? I, so I what, what do I need? If, I, if I'm bringing home a new dog tonight, what, yeah. what should I have already got? You know, it's the basics, um, and I feel like for a lot of people, this is going to be um, a refresher, but you're going to want your food dishes, your water dishes. Um, actually, let's rewind by saying you should definitely have this stuff beforehand. Same thing I talked yes. about with cleaning your yard. It's so much fun to take puppies and new dogs to new areas and pet stores and stuff. But once again, we run a very high risk of disease. And then when we come to adopting dogs, we don't want to flood them with too many new situations. You know, who knows what they've already been through. Let's get them home, get them comfortable in the place that they're going to spend forever. And, you know, spend a few weeks getting them comfortable there before we start venturing out to these new big places with our dogs. So, um, yeah, get all this stuff ready beforehand. Uh, food dishes, water bowls, um, food in general, uh, you know, it's going to be dependent on what kind of dog you get what size dog it's going to end up being. Um, maybe they have some dietary restrictions already. So you're going to want food, but you're, you're also going to want the right food. Um, you're going to want a leash. You're going to want a walking device. I highly recommend the easy walk harness for all ages. Um, you can find them almost anywhere. They're the front clipping harnesses with the D ring in front. Um, it makes it easy to start redirecting your dog back at the side. Um, and once again, when we start these things earlier, it's easier to hold out with them. So I would recommend starting with that harness. Um, and then as your dog grows, you'll start to understand, does he pull? Is he good by my side? And then you can kind of start playing with what walking devices you use. Um, you're going to want a collar. You're going to want tags on that collar. Um, especially for puppies, your collar is nothing more than a tag holder. You know, we don't want to be jerking little puppy by the neck or anything like that. Um, and I would put, you know, your current number, your address on there, but I wouldn't put their name. You know, who knows if Fido gets out and now all of a sudden somebody knows the dog's name. Um, it's just easier for you to prove that it's your dog when you, if you do have to get it back. Um, aside from that, you're going to want a crate. I highly recommend getting a crate. I know some people are still a little iffy about crate training and stuff like that. I think there's many wonderful benefits of it. Um, but if you don't plan on using a crate, I still think you should figure out how to confine your dog, uh, even if it's just for puppy training purposes. Um, have some kind of pen, some kind of playpen, some kind of small area. Um, or have gates. That's another thing that I think is on my full list is baby gates, puppy gates. You yeah. know, if you don't plan on creating your dog, at least you have a way to confine your dog's space. Um, whether you have to leave them unattended or you're doing this for potty training reasons. Um, I literally have a gate in every doorway of my house. And it's like, I can keep a dog anywhere, anytime for anything going on. You can corral um, them anywhere. You can't go wrong. You know, if somebody comes to the door that your dog's not familiar, it just, it makes things so much easier when you have a way to um, separate them from situations. Um, you're gonna want poop bags, poop bag holders. If you're super green, you can just use your, your, your you know, your grocery bags. Yep. Um, but picking up your dog's poop is, highly important and in, in a lot of places it's the law. So yep. I would definitely get Requiring. some poop bags. 
Um, cleaning supplies, um, no matter what age dog you're getting, accidents are going to happen, whether you're actively potty training or um, Rover ends up just getting sick with a quick stomach flu and, you know, spits up on the carpet. At least you have something to go ahead and clean that up. Uh, and the wonderful thing about cleaning supplies for dogs that are marked for dogs is they typically have enzymes that are going to eat away at those urine stains and stuff and make it a little less likely that a dog pees back over that. Um, <clears throat> bedding is important. I love my Orvis bed, but I do not give them to puppies. If you have a puppy, <laughs> bedding should be towel or plush because you're going to be so mad when that dog chews up that really nice bed. Um, so those are the couple of things I would start out for bedding. Um, first aid kit, you never know when accidents happen and your first aid kit may be, um, the difference between a, a medical situation being a medical emergency or not. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you're going to want toys. We love durable toys. Um, you know, when you're crate training, you're probably going to use toys in the crate. We like uh, Nyla bones, Benny bones, Kong toys, things that are long lasting and don't um, tend to, to make a choking hazard or an obstruction hazard for your dog um, because puppies also don't know what's edible and what's not edible and we want to um, curb those situations from happening um grooming supplies you know you're gonna want once again earlier the better if you can start your dog just with positive associations to brushes combs clipping uh, of their nails it's going to make for way easier situations down the road so i would at least get a little starter pack of these things so you can start just rewarding them for being around them um, and with that, I would also understand what your dog's long-term grooming needs are going to be. Uh, if you have doodles, other long-haired dogs that don't shed and definitely need a lot of upkeep, you're going to want to go ahead and make an appointment with your groomer now. Uh, even if you don't have the dog, you know, groomers are like one of the highest growing jobs within the dog industry right now. And they stayed booked, especially after COVID. So yeah. if you are getting a dog that requires a lot of grooming needs, go ahead and get a groomer on the schedule. Um, a lot of them have like puppy introduction bathing classes or not classes, but appointments to where they just start your dog getting comfortable being there. So grooming staff or a groomer in general. Um, and good vet care. You know, I think it's important to have someone you trust as your vet um, and set that person up once again before you get the dog. Uh, I know when I bring puppies home, I like to get them in immediately. Even if they don't need their vaccinations at that time, it's just great to take your dog in, have your vet do a one over, make sure that you're not physically missing anything that your dog may be showing you, uh, you know, whether it's dietary needs or, you know, early hip dysplasia, stuff like that, you can go and have your vet do a good one over. Um, but those are definitely the things that I would start out for, for any dog, puppy or adopted. Gotcha. And you can stop in your local Orvis store. They have yeah. all those things. Um, we, we have a wide variety of dog products um, from beds, uh, water bowls, mm -hmm. feed bowls, toys, toys treats. We tons of new stuff just came in, so so yeah. stop in, see your oh, see your Orvis folks, and they will they'll take good care of you, helping you pick out the right stuff. Oh yeah. Real quick, so we have a lot of questions around dog walking. We'll get to them. Yeah. It's one of our topics we're tonight. Getting so here. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, so one I, one question I get a lot of times is, how often do I feed my new dog? So is yeah. it once a day, twice a day? Do I break up the portions? So what yeah. what would you recommend there? Yeah, once again, I would not be afraid to, number one, um, if you're adopting a dog, um, check in with who you're adopting it from, ask what schedule they're already on. You know, we don't want to throw dogs off too much if they're coming from a rescue situation. Um, if you are getting a puppy from a breeder, you can also check in with your breeder. How often has this dog been getting fed? How often do you recommend feeding it? Um, I think right now the AKC standard for puppies is three times a day. Um, and, you know, Mary next week or I think the week after may be able to clarify if I'm wrong or anything. Um, but puppies should be fed small amounts more often. Uh, it helps them stay satiated um, and fueled up. Um, 
So, or if you're a trainer like me, what you can do is just feed them all through the day. We like to use puppy food as treats when first starting out with training a dog. So it's easy to get engagement when you're using their food that they're already wanting. Um, And it's a very easy way to not exhaust your treat options too soon by just using their puppy food. Um, So yeah, I would say for puppies, about three times a day is the AKC standard, but um, more than anything, get into that vet check with them, make sure that you're, you're setting them up for success. And then roughly time frame to switch from puppy food to adult food. Yeah. Anywhere between 12 months and 16 months, puppyhood ranges breed to breed, um, and size, different size dogs. So definitely look into what kind of breed you have and figure out when that's typically done. I know for Suge, uh, who's an English setter uh, and about 53 pounds, I didn't switch her until uh, to adult food until about two months ago. So about 13 months old. Gotcha. And then you mentioned chewing on things, dog beds. So how do you you keep a puppy from (laughs) chewing on shoes things in the house if they do yeah. get a hold of something anything we don't want really right. um so i'll take a sip of wine on that note because that's <laughs> one of those topics Wait, of red or white red always red oh my goodness Good. um so when it comes to puppy chewing first thing to understand about chewing barking play biting all these things they're normal things that your puppy does. Um, They're very annoying to us as humans, very physiologically normal for dogs to engage in. Um, So I would be proactive about it. Don't wait for the biting to get so intense before you're like, oh crap, what do I do now? Um, So just like I said with um, the Benny bones and Nyla bones, they kind of look like this is a type of Nyla bone and this is a type of Nyla bone. And then there's a whole bunch of other types of Nyla bone different chewing grades, um, same material. You can see Suge has been working on this one about a year now, and it's still relatively intact. It's, you know, chewed up and ground up a little bit, but still in its form because it's made to be long lasting. It's made to not chip off. And if it does chip off, it's not going to hurt the dog's system. Um, Providing toys like that are already going to allow your dog to engage in a chewing habit. Um, Chewing is very important for dogs. It's part of um, the mental makeup of a dog. It's very soothing. It's very mentally stimulating. And we should be promoting it as much as we can in the right way. Obviously, we don't want it to be our shoes and clothes and stuff. Uh, So like I said before, the first thing you can do is be proactive about keeping your stuff out of reach, right? If your dog is able to get to particular things, um, it's not really their fault. We have to be understanding of what we need to do to set them up for success. So first of all, keep everything out the way. If you're realizing the older they get, the more they get into other areas to retrieve these things, find new hiding spots, find new areas to store them. Um, But another thing you can do in the moment is object exchange. So let's say Fido is chewing on your shoe, going to town. Um, One thing I wouldn't do is run up to them and reprimand them. Um, It can be startling. And what you get is a dog then evading your space with that item. So then moving forward, every time you go to get that object, well, they're going to book it another place because they know that you're going to take this and after last time. Um, So I would just go up calmly. Um, First thing I would do is I would have a treat in hand and I would go ahead and put the treat to their nose, which is going to encourage a dropping motion. Um, Once they drop it, reward them for dropping. We're not rewarding them for chewing on our shoes or anything. We're rewarding for the action of dropping something. Um, You can even add in the cue drop if you want, but give them the reward. While you're taking the shoe, replace it with the item that you want them to chew on. That's gonna be your object exchange. Now, some people try this and maybe dogs still wants to get other things. Consistency, consistency, consi- we have to keep doing these things in order for it to make a long lasting neurological connection for our dog. So just do it, keep doing it, you know. Um, and what that's also gonna help prevent is resource guarding. Uh, oftentimes what happens with resource guarding is we create that in our dogs. We're always taking stuff away from them. And eventually they get to the point where I don't want this thing to be taken away. And that's when we start seeing growling, you know, a little snarl, maybe a snap. So giving them something in exchange to let them know, hey, chewing's cool, but you chew this instead of this is going to definitely help with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people's first reactions to rub them in the dog, right? 
Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and I think shaming, uh, you know, makes for cute YouTube videos, right? Like, oh, you did this. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't actually hold weight for our dog. Yep. I know it looks like our dog is actually showing like, oh my gosh, I did something. But they don't understand accountability and they don't understand shaming. So even though we get a reaction from our dog, doesn't mean that they're making this correlation of, oh, I messed up. I just see my owners waving their finger and kind of coming yeah. down on me. So I would definitely um, work with object exchange, um, you know, Pick stuff up after yourself, no matter what it is. I think family, uh, household with kids have the hardest time with stuff like this. You know, kids tend to, you know, leave a Barbie down, leave other stuff around. Um, but I can also say that um, we don't always get to catch our dog at these moments, um, which can easily end up as a health situation if they actually ingest something they shouldn't, whether it's poison or an obstruction, which Barbie toys tend to do a lot. I've seen a lot of barbie pieces being uh, cut out of dogs um yeah. so that also comes with supervision you know if we can supervise our dog when they're out and about it's going to also alleviate how much they're getting into these things that we don't want them to be chewing on um so that's probably my third main point is supervise your dog if your dog is out especially a young puppy and a new dog to the household you need to be keeping an eye on cool. um crate training want to transition that is you mentioned crates like we're flowing into transition. i'm like supervise right? them. if you cannot supervise your dog this is where crates become so so necessary um i like to think of a dog crate as a bedroom you know um it's a safe place it's somewhere that yep. they can go to uh so even if you don't want to crate train for the potty reasons or the supervision reasons i would still recommend having a crate i would say even if it's just set up with a nice Orvis bed in it or anything else, having a place that your dog can go when it needs to evade any other situation is they're going to be thankful. I know they can't tell you, but they're going to be. Um, sometimes, you know, kids are around and, and maybe they're not used to being around kids. They can go to their crate. They know I have a safe place. Um, thunderstorms, you know, construction happening outside. It, it acts as a den and a safe place that your dog can go to. Um, and with that, if you do have kids, I would 100% advocate that your dog's safe space is its safe space. You shouldn't have people trying to pull your dog out the crate if they're willingly going in there, messing with them through it. Their place is their place. Um, so, I mean, besides just being able to be safe within a den type area, um, it has its potty training advantages, right? You know, if we can't supervise our dogs, um, which is a big thing for potty training, we know we have a crate. Uh, we also can time out our potty breaks really nicely with a crate as well. So um, a great way to start positively associating, uh, associating your dog to the crate by simply feeding them in the crate. Um, so in the morning when I get up, first thing I do is I let my puppy out. I let them go potty. Um, if they do go potty, I'm rewarding and um, giving them a treat. Then we're coming back inside to the crate again. Uh, I'm letting her get in the crate and I'm presenting with her food and I'm gonna shut her in there while she eats. Um, it's an easy way to understand that the crate does mean something good. I get my food in here, I get my water in here. Um, and after I feed and water a dog in the crate, I know in about, 25 to 30 minutes, this dog's going to have to pee. Um, so at about that time, I'm going to come back out. I'm going to let them outside to go potty. <clears throat> if they go potty, great. We get some free time. We get to play. We get to do a little training. We get to go for a walk, all that cool stuff. Uh, if they don't go potty, we go back in the crate. Um, and simply just to wait it out, just to understand that the consistency of coming out the crate immediately means we go outside. Um, and the reason a crate does work really well for potty training is if you get the right size for your dog um, and you do it the right way, you make these positive associations, dogs typically don't want to pee and poop where they eat and sleep. Um, so you know that you're going to be able to help them develop some kind of bladder muscles by utilizing the crate. Um, which also means that you're going to want to get the right size crate. Um, you're going to want to plan for the dog that your dog is going to become. So if you get a little Great Dane puppy, I would say, I mean, not a little Great Dane, but a Great Dane puppy, um, you're going to want to get a Great Dane size crate, right? Um, yep. And they'd make, you know, the wired crates that have dividers. And I think even Rufflin has new dividers for their yep. crates. Um, 
So you're going to want to get something that you can, your dog can grow into, but you can also make sure you scale down the size for when it's a puppy. Um, because, you know, bigger the area, the more likely they are to um, pee and poop in there. Um, and that's great for puppies, right? But some of us adopt dogs. Some of us get right. older dogs and need to know how to potty train as well. Um, <clears throat> and I would say that the crate can be just as beneficial depending on the dog, but this happens a lot with pet store dogs as well, is when dogs are kept in small containers, my cat coming to say I see hello. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when dogs are already confined into small areas, they figure out, I have to go potty here. You know, nobody's letting me out on yeah. a schedule. Nobody's worried about, you know, me getting outside. I have to potty here. So it can be a lot more frustrating, a little bit harder to utilize the crate for those dogs because they get a little comfortable with, you know, yeah. ex you know, going where they're at. Um, but once again, consistency, making a schedule, keeping up with it would help with that. But yeah, your crate is going to have a, a, a lot of perks. Okay, so let's get into the questions that are coming across. So, <laughs> um, so taking your dog out for a walk, you mentioned that, you know, dogs get excited about that. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'll, I'll go to the, to the panel here. The first question is my dog does a military dog crawl and we've gone through training. She's very hard to walk. We tried to change directions, walk with treats and toys, but nothing sticks. So what would you recommend to, to help out with that? So, you know, first of all, I would say, I would love for you to define a military crawl. Um, Cause if it's what I'm picturing, I'm imagining a dog scared and kind of crawling across. That's where my head was at, yep. Yeah, okay. So if that is the case, I would say your dog has poor leash socialization. Um, walking devices and leashes are just like everything else to where we can't just throw them on our dog. I know we used to, you know, back 20 years ago, we would just do anything with our dog and they would figure it out. I don't know what has changed in the water since then, but dogs do need socialization to things. So um, I know for instance, even being a dog trainer, my dog has a poor socialization to back clipping harnesses. If you put something on her back, she she melts. It, it, <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing. Um, but the way we counteracted that is, um, we're gonna probably end up segueing into clipper, clicker training after this, we got treats. And we simply just started by whatever the walking device was, putting it on the ground next to her, letting her sniff it, letting her play with it, what have you. If she did a good job and was interested, we would reward her. We would reward her the whole time. Um, and we did this over days. It wasn't just a, okay, let's do this real quick and throw the harness on her. It's a process. Um, so after she got comfortable with just seeing the leash, uh, the harness come out, because she would look at it. I've had this dog my whole life. She's never been hurt by a harness or anything. And she would still look at this harness like, oh, my gosh. So we would simply then just start holding it. If she didn't, you know, cower away, yes, reward. Yes, reward. We're creating that understanding of this is okay. Karen's a reward while it's out. Um, and then simply we would start touching it to her back. Reward. Touch yep. it to her back reward um, until the day we finally got to put it through her legs. And then that's all we did that day. Reward, put it through the leg, reward, until we can clip, reward, unclip, clip, reward. Until yep. we could get the leash on her. See, it's a process until you can yep. actually get out the door with it. Um, so I would say, you know, hope isn't lost. If your dog is melting every time they see a, a, a leash, it's just they're they're not used to it. Even if you have been using it forever, they obviously still just don't understand that this is um, a positive thing in their life. And you just have to create those positive connections for them. My dog, please don't chew on my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what I would say do there. And I also say definitely get um, some kind of walking device. I would start first with getting that good association back with the leash. And then I would, if you're not already using a walking device, I don't want to assume anything. Um, but if you're not, I would start looking into some options that are out there and then start creating those positive associations with that. Gotcha. So this kind of dovetails into one of our topics, but we'll go ahead and jump in here. So when hiking or walking on the road, my one and a half year old pup gets stoked about other dogs, pups, to the point of ignoring me and and any learned leash rules. Yeah. Any tips there? That's so normal, you know. Yep. Um, even if your dog isn't by dictionary reactive, um, <clears throat> dogs get excited when they see other dogs, especially young dogs. So uh, 
what we call it is over threshold. So if your dog is getting to the point where they're seeing other dogs on leash or in any situation and they're no longer minding you or anything they know, that's being over threshold. Um, and that just means that the reinforcer that's there as well as you, which is that other dog can be a reinforcer. Uh, a reinforcer is anything in any situation that provides um, some kind of good, re uh, uh, so uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just something that is going to bring pleasure to the dog in general. And another dog can definitely be that. So you're going to want to, in my opinion, what I would do is create more distance. I would create distance and to the point where my dog is listening to me. Um, and this is something that anyone can work with at any time is understanding when your dog is at threshold. So um, when I'm walking Fido and we see another dog, I'm taking note of when he notices that dog. Uh, and then after he notices the dog, when is he starting to perk up his ears at that dog? Then when is he starting to stand firm towards that dog? And then when am I starting to see maybe hackles raised compared to barking? So there's a kind of a gradual step into that threshold before we just lose all connection with our dog. So I would start with that. I would create some distance. And once you create that distance, be mindful of when your dog starts listening again and then start training in that kind of threshold. And then before you know it, when you stay consistent with it, then you can start closing in that threshold until you can get near a dog without your dog going absolutely ballistic. Um, but like everything else with training, it takes time, energy and effort, and it is a lifelong process. Um, and I would definitely say if this is something you really do want to work with, whatever area you're in, definitely look into a positive reinforcement trainer that can help you with these goals for sure. Yep. Uh, backtrack just a little bit. Do you recommend a prong collar for a lab? I don't recommend a prong collar for any dog. There you go. <laughs> this is where I come a little different than other uh, trainers. So on the topic of prong collar, I do not judge anyone for using them. If it's a device you use and you are getting um, success from it, good for you. Um, and uh, that's great. I have no issue with it. But there is a scale of adversity, um, whereas prong collars, e-collars, choke chains, stuff like that definitely fall into that adversive category. Um, and we just don't use them. I do personally think that um, depending on the trainer, adversive tools are only as adversive as the trainer that uses them with the dog they're using them on. Now, that also means that not all trainers are created equally. And if you are working with someone who recommends adversive tools, they be they better be very educated, certified um, professional people in order to give you the best understanding of how to use these things. But um, personally, what I would do instead, just to segue real quick, is there should be some kind of fundamental learning behind everything. That's where clicker training kind of comes in for a lot of people. It's that positive reinforcement side of training. Um, no matter what kind of trainer you are, whether you use e collars, prong collars, force free, positive reinforcement, all of us are using the element of positive reinforcement, um, which is just creating that understanding of our dog, which is where the clicker kind of comes in, right? So um getting to use clicker training is going to start your dog understanding when they're doing something correctly so first thing you're going to want to do is load the clicker which means you're going to want to add value to this um, and you do that by clicking and rewarding your dog clicking rewarding your dog that's the first step of it you're going to do this for days you're going to do it a few sessions a day um, until you test your dog and click and they're gonna lip lick or you know, they're going to show you, oh, I know what that means. Yep. And once you have that load, you can do whatever you need to do. So that's leash walking of, um, you know, a prong collar is great to correct a dog. But once again, we can't spend all of our time correcting a dog. We have to show them what they're also doing right. So as much as we want to yank, 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 well, when are you marking the moment that they're actually doing the right thing? So on our walk, I would bring a high value treat especially if you don't want to use a prong collar, bring a high value treat. Um, high value means cheese, chicken, salmon, ground beef, whatever it is. Um, and your dog will often tell you what that is. You know, there's always a typical kind of food that they go nuts for. Uh, put it in your treat pouch, put it in a Ziploc bag while you walk. Every time your dog looks at you, click and give that treat. Every time they look back, click and give that treat. And what you're creating is an unprompted check-in. 
and your dog's going to start understanding, well, every time I check in, I get a reward. I have no need to stray out in front. The rewards aren't there out front. The rewards are back here by her side, you know? Mm -hmm. So during walks at any point in time, just click, give that reward, click, give that reward. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, and, and let that also be a rule for everyone. Don't go anywhere without treats. Every moment is a training opportunity. So many missed moments happen in training when people don't bring their treats with them. So definitely have those ready. Um, short leash, long leash, when should I use and why? So um, for dog walking, I play around with leash sizes. You know, some days I want to run with my dog. I know it doesn't look like I've been running lately, but sometimes I like to run with my dog. So maybe I want them out front of me, uh, especially if we're on a trail or something like that. So I tend to use maybe a six foot leash for that. Um, sometimes I want them to run at my side. Maybe I use a four foot leash or even a waist clipping leash. Um, but the check cords, which I think a lot of people are thinking of when they say long leash, you can get in 15 feet, 30 feet, 60 yeah. feet. Um, and they're great for a lot of upland training, um, but recall in general, if you are looking to positively reinforce your dog in training, um, check cords are going to be a wonderful tool when it comes to recall because um, you're going to want to proof that behavior on a long lead before you take off that lead. So that long leash is going to be able to give you distance in order to safely recall your dog during practice. Um, so that's usually what the long lead is wonderful for uh, upland training and recall training, I would say. Okay. Um, so we touched on this a little bit, but what about if the dog, like, have a dog at the house seems to be hyper a lot how do i how do i help calm him or her down um i would say first what is your breed what breed mix may this be understanding your dog's genetic um predispositions to act a particular way to be high energy to be excitable um is going to save you a lot of headaches <laughs> Number one, if you're already getting a dog that has the energy level you need in your life, it's going to be so much better than trying to, shit, I have a cattle dog and I live in an apartment. Um, how do I work with this now? Um, so number one, be mindful of your dog's genetic makeup. Um, number two, understand that depending on your dog's genetic makeup, um, a 30 minute walk and some playtime inside may not be all your dog needs. Um, and it's really not all any dog needs, which is exactly why I have a business as a dog walker. You know, you can always hire people to come help you with your dog's energy needs. Um, we do different things like take dogs to dog parks, take them on hikes, mm -hmm. uh, just get them out for extra walks. Um, so you may want to introduce something like that into your life. Um, but also understanding that dogs have more needs than just physical energy release. Um, we've already mentioned the chewing. Chewing is very mentally stimulating for your dog and just giving them something to chew on can actually greatly um, decrease how much energy release they're going to need. Um, it's not the end all be all, but it can definitely help. Um, also having other things like um, the dog puzzles, stuff like that, where dogs can actually use their mind and nose to sniff out things. Um, because sniffing is another big, uh, you know, mental makeup of a dog. It's how they engage with the world around them. Um, and as dog owners, we tend to not want dogs to do things that are natural for them, like sniffing. You know, I see a lot of people on walks preventing their dog from sniffing everything out there. Um, which is like, oh my gosh, this is like one of the few things I get to do. So. <laughs> Stuff like this may be able to help you facilitate that kind of behavior. Um, you know, we already mentioned the Nyla bones, stuff like that. Um, a good con with some yep. good old peanut butter, amazing. Um, just that licking, another natural behavior that's mentally stimulating is licking. If you put this with some peanut butter, I mean, you can step it with anything, yogurt, pumpkin puree, blueberries, anything your dog likes that's healthy, and just throw it in the freezer. And then, you know, even with crate training, you can throw that in there, keep them busy while they're in. And it's another positive association, but it's also mentally very stimulating for them. Um, I think another new concept to a lot of people are the snuffle mats, uh, which look like these. Where am I? Um, and what it is, it's, it's just a new kind of uh, dog dish. You know, you get to hide the kibble throughout there and just letting your dog kind of forage out their food is also very mentally stimulating. Um, dogs, if we didn't have them 
cozy up by fireplaces would typically be foraging animals, right? They're not going to actually be hunters like, um, you know, wolves or anything like that. They're going to forage for their food. Uh, and this is going to help them kind of engage in that. Into a Figure out what they love. Fetch. Uh, engage in. You can see you can have like hundreds of sports that not just um, not just purebred dogs get to engage in, right? And, you know, mixed breeds and stuff can actually do a lot of these events. So if you find what your dog actually enjoys doing and get them signed up to actually engage in these things, you can have so much more energy and mental stimulation, uh, energy release and mental stimulation for your dog. Um, but just circling back around to understanding what kind of dog you have and what their genetically predisposition, uh, their genetic predisposition is, um, it's going to help you a lot. You know, I think that's it's very important. Yeah. Do, do your homework, right? When yeah, dog do fits homework. your lifestyle the best and the space you live in. Exactly. I mean, people like me and my setter all the time are like, I would never, have a dog like that but hey for me someone who's always on the go and enjoys hunting and you know hunt tests and dock diving and stuff like that she's she's my perfect fit yep we touched on this a little bit but collar versus harness um, yeah, yeah. benefits of each yeah you... so i would always have a collar for my dog and i would always have updated tags on it um that is what a collar is for it's so if for some reason, Fido does get out into the big wide world. Um, people have a way of getting a hold of you. Um, a lot, you know, microchips are great, you know, if somebody takes the time to get your dog to a vet to scan them, scan right? It. You know, um, a lot of people don't care to um, yeah. or just don't. So it's just a nice, easy way to expedite your dog getting back home to you. Um, the neck has a lot of muscles and uh, different pressure points um, and tugging against that long term through their life can be pretty damaging. Um, so I would recommend not walking your dog on a flat leash unless you have loose leash trained your dog. Like mm -hmm. everything else we've talked about, conditioning is so important if your dog is not conditioned to walk on the collar and just pulls i would take that time to train them to do so if, if that's the way you really want to walk them um but yeah i i personally like harnesses you know yep. um i think the easy walks are my favorite once again they clip in front they help redirect your dog um if you do have an extreme puller the gentle leaders are nice the face harnesses uh that go on your dog which kind of just act as um pretty much a dog bridle, but there's nothing that like, there's no bite for a dog or anything like that. But um, the pressure that, you know, if they pull forward, the pressure kind of helps them kind of back up. But like everything else, for some dogs, it immediately takes hold. And for other dogs, you have to condition them. So right. I would just be mindful once again of what your dog's predisposition is um, for pulling or anything like that, and then choose accordingly. Cool. Um, when do you start introducing dogs to other people or oh, other dogs? It is critical to start early. So actually it's so critical that it's called the critical socialization period. Um, it is between eight weeks and 16, 16 weeks. Um, this is the time in which your dog's puppy brain is taking in everything new in the world. This is the perfect time to start making good connections to the world around them. Um, you know, everyone kind of gets in a rush to get their dog out in the world. And I think it's, it is important to, to get your dog out socializing, but socialization is only beneficial if it's positive. You know, you can socialize your dog to everything in the world, but if every time they go out, they're having a negative experience, we're creating poor socialization and we're still going to end up with a fearful dog, right? So um, we can socialize with new people and new dogs and, and kids and um, even thinking bigger on the socialization spectrum of trash cans, you know, the big blue trash cans that get picked up during trash day, um, you know, uh, fire hydrants, all the things that we don't think to think about. Um, and there's actually a socialization checklist on our resources page on our website and it has everything on there from strollers to canes, wheelchairs, anything that we maybe wouldn't think of that our dogs experience in the real world. And um, we don't realize that there's going to be an issue until our dog gets in front of those things and is like, 
oh my gosh, what is that? You know, so seeking out these things, not necessarily seeking out these things, but being mindful of these things. So when your puppy is between the eight and 16 weeks, you can take them up and say, hey, you know what? My dog's never seen a wheelchair before. Do you mind if he checks it out real quick? Uh, and it's as simple as just letting your dog go up to it. Um, you know, even at uh, 15 months old, sometimes Suge experiences things that we never thought of introducing her to before. You know, actually we were in Alabama and there's one of those inflatable foil yeah. arm guys and she was like oh my gosh what the heck is that um so all i did was i stood right next to it i stood quiet next to it i petted the wavy arm man <laughs> you know uh, i didn't you know baby talk her into it or anything i just showed with my body language that this is okay and once she came up and started sniffing it yes good dog here's your rewards for yeah. that you know um so just being mindful of these things we don't have to make our dog introduce itself to anything but just giving it the opportunity to try uh and then once they do try having those food rewards ready to positively reward them um is definitely a big thing uh but yeah eight to 16 weeks is when your dog is absorbing the whole world around them if you are planning on socialization uh socializing with other dogs i would definitely make sure that these dogs are fully vaccinated and well socialized themselves dog park is not the place to socialize your dog okay um the issue with the dog park and i'm someone who goes to the dog park you know my dog does enjoy it but the issue we have is everybody kind of works with their dog different right like up until recently nobody's really followed an exact standard unfortunately um so maybe these dogs are all well socialized but socialize differently and have a different way of communicating to each other. Um, it can send a lot of mixed signals to a dog who's just now receiving information from the world around them. Um, so I would not start with a dog park or anything like that. Actually, a lot of trainers would say, don't even go to a dog park at all. Um, if you never go, I don't think you're missing out on anything. My dog, I have a, I have a hunting dog in a city environment. We go to the dog park. So, um, but yeah, eight to 16 weeks. And then remind yourself that after 16 weeks, your dog typically has a bounce back period. So um, it's this, this period in which they maybe haven't seen that thing they've been socialized with in a little bit, right? So they end up running into it again. And now all of a sudden they're scared out of nowhere. Like, oh my gosh, what is that? So then you still have to take those moments that, oh, you know that, you, you know, you don't pull them on. You still have to take that moment again to re-socialize them. Um, and then you're gonna hit adolescence after that. And you just have to kind of keep up with these things. But eight to 16 weeks, um, do not sleep on that period. It is very important. I know a lot of people get puppies and they, uh, I heard recently someone say um, that they wanted to wait to work with their dog until they created a bond with their dog. And that's the perfect time to go ahead and start creating a bond with everything. You know, mm -hmm. training is the way to create a bond with your dog. Um, you want to get into travel? Yeah. Yeah. I love traveling with my dog. Right. Uh, so it's, you know, I joke, she's been in Alabama for two months. If you're on Facebook, you're probably already engaging with my training mentor, uh, Dr. Dale Hubbard. Um, amazing guy. She's been with him. Um, and this is also, you know, great time to say, seek professional help at any point in time. If you are having any troubles at all and not even, you don't have to wait till you're having trouble. Sometimes you just need a little bit more consistency in your training and a trainer you know, on a regular schedule can create that for you. Um, I knew with my husband moving to Alabama, running a business of my own, um, I was going to need help with Suge. Um, and Dr. Dale Hubbard has not only been a wonderful help for her in keeping her up with her training, but advancing her training and advancing my knowledge at the same time. Um, so no matter how much you think you know in the dog world, don't be afraid to ask for additional advice. Um, with that, uh, we go to Alabama all the time to see him. So a um, couple of things that we do, I have a wonderful checklist here. Uh, a lot of my, she's in Alabama right now. So a lot of my fun travel stuff is literally with her. I have this awesome, like big Orvis, like uh, to go bag. And it has, I have one of the, I have like two of these dry food. There you go. Yep, the weekend or travel kit. Yes, yep. I love it. So I put like all of her food in one. And then since it is like water resistant, I put my tech stuff in the other. So maybe like my GoPro, um, not that that's a necessity when you, it's a necessity when you travel. It's a get necessity. A, you don't have a GoPro, get a GoPro. <laughs> um, but we also keep like uh, her GPS collar, stuff like that. So, um, I mean, depending on what kind of traveling and what you're doing with your dog, I think GPS collars are a wonderful idea. Um, 
being out in the middle of nowhere or somewhere you haven't been before and you know once again those environmental distractions get to your dog and those behaviors you thought you proved turn out that oh they don't compete with a running raccoon or running deer you know you want to be able to get your dog back if you need to so there's a lot of um uh gps type collars out there um i also make sure that her she has I, I know it seems like i'm just plugging orvis stuff all the time but i have so much orvis stuff <laughs> she also wears her orvis collar everywhere we go because uh they have the ones that um you can embroider the name and number on so even if your tag for some reason falls off there's still a way for somebody to identify your dog and get a hold of you so that's my favorite i do have the leash to go with it because why not match right. um, but you're definitely going to make sure you have your normal leash and i would also so get a long line. Um, once again, if you are going to a new, a new situation, a new environment, um, even with my dog who has now developed a wonderful recall, thank you, Dr. Dale Hubbard. Um, we still put a long line of safety, you know. Um, you're gonna wanna bring your food. I would bring enough food for the trip, but I would also bring enough for a few days extra. You don't know if maybe, I've definitely had this happen, we're in the tent, a raccoon chews its way in and half our dog food is gone now. So definitely bring extra just in case something like that happens or your trip just ends up being longer for some reason. Um, any medications your dog's normally on, obviously bring those. Um, once again, bring some extra just in case anything happens. Um, don't go anywhere without rewards, you know, even yeah. if, you know, and, and I mean, it's the perfect time to train, right? If we're already working on all these behaviors that are becoming proofed and solidified in all these other environments, changing your dog's environment is how you keep up with proofing that. So bring your treats so you can get good training sessions in when you are traveling. Um, it's only going to help your dog understand these things. Um, I also like to make a little sheet of identification. It typically has a picture of my dog, um, her vet records on there. So if we end up somewhere where, um, let's say for instance, I get hurt and now there's nobody to take my dog. I may need to take her to a local boarding facility facility or uh, a vet clinic or something else fits her. Um, the hammock uh, seat holders from or seat covers from Orvis, uh, it nicely makes a, a kind of like a swing in the back seat so the dog can't get to the front seat, um, which I also think is a bit comforting. Um, you do use uh, a cover, I would still recommend getting some kind of seat belt for your dog to fasten them in. Um, especially if you're on a long drive, you know, you don't need the distraction of your pup trying to hop up front or anything um and if an accident does happen um unfortunately so if your dog doesn't have a crate back there uh died um aside from that having you know you and your dog hydrated um having bedding for your trip um whether it's in the crate in your tent whatever you plan on doing like i said earlier uh first aid kit i do have my dog first aid kit in here it has everything thing including like one of the suture gun actually right in the field give her a couple staples before getting her to the dog you want for playtime whether that's tennis balls water bumpers um just anything that you think is going to keep your dog's attention you know more than just having play time with your dog we want to have things that are going to and, and somewhere new didn't um you know maybe some car cleaner just in case they do get car sick a lot of dogs do get car sick it's um and then with that if you, you do know your dog is prone to getting car sick 
topic, you can always talk to your vet about some serenia um, or some drama means something mm -hmm. else too, or if LA nice and soothe. Um, and all, a lot of our travel is for hunting. So one thing that I do love to bring with is um, most of the cap is broken off of it right now, um, but it's the Green Mountain Tick Repellent. Oh, yeah. I think I even got this in the Orba store. Uh, another shameless plug. This stuff is so good. And I have been tick infested places and I just spray her down from head to toe or the tail and no tick touch her, um, which is surprising because she has that. That go have you know anywhere you're going. I would even have a plan of action. Excellent, thank you. I was like, did we freeze? Um, <laughs> we are at about time. We are. It I flew by. Sure. Well, we did. It did. It was fun. Um, so I know there are a lot of things that we were going to talk about. Um, if anyone does have other questions, you're more than welcome to email me, send me a Facebook or Instagram message, um, get a hold of Dr. Dill Hubbard, or find yep. a certified professional within your area to help you a little bit but more in depth with your training needs. Good stuff. Yeah, good points. Um, be sure to check out your website. You broke up a little bit. I'm not sure if you threw that in there, but urbanuplander.com, tons of resources on there. Um, Fun stuff. It looks like, yep, looks like it's in the chat. So you can just click there and go straight to your website. Lots of good stuff on your blog. I've read through it um, over the past yeah. few weeks. So. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, all my best blogs are right on the Orvis site, so definitely go Same. check those out. Um, if you have more questions about leash walking or crate training, I have two awesome blogs right on the Orvis site. Um, yep. I know we didn't get to talk too much about upland hunting, but uh, it's one of my favorite things. Um, and uh, we're also positive reinforcement upland trainers, which means we're just trying to provide a training alternative to the traditional training that is out there. So if you've been interested in hunting, but really maybe want to try a different way of doing it, definitely give myself or Dr. Dale Hubbard a call. We have to be a whole nother one, right? Whole nother one. <laughs> whole uh, nother. Couple of things. Don't forget, you can stop in your local Orvis store, check out all kinds of dog product. Melinda has tons of them. You saw it tonight. Um, also, right now is our Orvis dog cover contest is going on through the 31st of this month. Um, so you can submit photos of your own dog um, to, a, to, a, to be on the cover of our dog catalog. Um, one key thing to throw there is it's a dollar per vote. So if you just want to go vote for some of the photos already on there, um, it all goes straight to um, to curing canine cancer, which is which is important. Um, it is a minimum of five dollars. Um, so be sure and check that out. It's on the website as well. And then um, this Thursday we have a next the next live event. So this Thursday at eight o'clock, uh, fishing the small dry flies of fall. So we'll do a we'll cover some of that with Tom Rosenbauer and then. Um, the Jackson Hole store manager and entomologist Maggie Human um, will be on Thursday at eight. So be sure to tune in and um, look for it. It's great to see you virtually, Melinda. I'm sure I'll see you in the store soon. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, ben. It was a pleasure. Thanks for uh, feeling.